Hi everybody, Galen Fries here, lead producer at Emergency Entrance Studios, and I am incredibly excited to show you guys Maya of the Desert. The last nine months have been just a great experience with this team of 15, and we are so proud of what we've made. Maya of the Desert is a puzzle platformer where you use earth manipulating powers, or what we're calling geomancy, to overcome challenges, solve puzzles, and defeat a corrupt golem. The game's mechanics are inspired by Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, as well as Journey. After some experimentation uh, with art styles, we landed on an inspiration of 2008's Prince of Persia. But I don't want to hold you guys off from seeing the game for too long, so let's just jump right into it, shall we? And so this is Maya of the Desert, in the Desert. As I previously stated, the game takes inspiration from both Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Journey. You can see Journey's inspiration in the desert aesthetic, but Breath of the Wild inspiration may not be as immediately obvious. Uh, we have, as you can see, a large open world with temples dotted throughout. There are puzzles everywhere, and in those temples the player learns new powers of geomancy that they take back out into this open world and play around with. So let's show off some of those powers. First and foremost, the player can extrude pillars of earth. Uh, as they journey forward, one of the powers that they get is the ability to break off chunks of that rock that they have just extruded, pick it up, and throw it. What I'm doing right now is actually making my way into the final temple of the game. I wanted to show you guys a spot where the player had unlocked everything. So let's show what some of those puzzles are like, shall we? We have little areas hidden like that throughout the game where uh, you get these collectibles that I will show you momentarily. But, as I said before, this is the end of the game, and our design philosophy was to create a building experience where you took the powers that you learned throughout the game and build on them. So, as you can see in this puzzle to open the final temple, I've actually used the powers uh, that I have gained throughout several of the temples. And now I can enter. This would have been blocked otherwise, and so the player couldn't just progress to the end of the game. And here's the collectibles that I was just talking about. Mosaic pieces. So while I solve some of these puzzles in this final uh, temple, I'm going to explain the story and why there are mosaic pieces for you to collect. So you play as Maya, a desert wanderer. Uh, she begins the game out in a sandstorm. And as she's stumbling about, she comes across a sand, uh, sand dune with not so uh, stable footing. She falls through what uh, ends up being the ceiling of a temple, uh, falling onto a mosaic that has already been partially destroyed, and uh, she knocks a couple more chunks off of it. Uh, spirits come flying out of the mosaic as this happens, and uh, one of them comes up and essentially explains the situation to Maya. What's happened is there used to be an order known as the Geomancers. Uh, they were betrayed and no longer exists, but in their heyday, uh, their entire purpose was to stop entropy from taking over the world. They were the reason that life sprung everywhere, and as you just saw moments ago, the world is now one great big desert. So their, their powers have waned, and uh, the reason that we find for that is that their sacred mosaic has been destroyed. Uh, your fall onto it is kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back, and as such, the spirit uh, guilt trips you into going out into the desert, collecting all of the mosaic pieces that have been shattered about, and uh, defeating a corrupt golem. So, the golems, you've actually seen a couple of inert ones earlier in this temple, were constructs of the geomancers, and when the geomancers were betrayed one day, uh, the golems were used to come in and essentially attack that mosaic we were talking about earlier. So, uh, this betrayal is what has caused the uh, destruction of the mosaic that you are now going out and trying to repair the damage of. Uh, I'm trying to match up these ruins so I can see that there's different numbers and over here there are different notches in uh, these weighted scales and so that first symbol has two it's currently down on the third one there so I've done something wrong so I can see that that last one should need three so let's let's move that over shall we so the big ones are three when we look at these scales in here we can see 
the little ones also take you down to three, so I'm going to assume that they're one or two. And again, using this spell over here, we know that two should be the first one, and that the second one should be four. So let's get two of these little guys here, and hopefully I will hear a sound confirming that I've solved this puzzle. That worked on the first try. Another destructible wall. I will leave some secrets for you guys to find. But here we are coming up on uh, the final golem. So here is actually one of those spirits that I mentioned before. Uh, some of them increase your magical power. You saw on my bottom left I have a magic meter and that just went up through that collectible. So this is the golem fight. I am only going to show you a little bit of it because I would rather that you guys got to experience it for yourself. But he is big and scary. And uh, so you can actually hear this awesome music that was done by Audio Brew. Let's take some of these boulders that are happening and dodge them. And so what's happening is, as you can see, boulders are being thrown by the golem at me. I'm dodging them. And there's these pillars that are holding up the ceiling. My current goal is to knock down the pillars and then attempt to destroy the arena and defeat the golem. Uh, as you've seen so far, the game really doesn't have any combat. This is the closest thing we have to combat. And so we didn't want to have an experience where the player was forced to do something unnatural to them. Uh, this seemed like, instead of a direct piece of combat, that we were essentially showing the players combat through puzzles using powers that they'd learned. Oh. And as you saw there, I can actually take damage. It's somewhat easy to die here. If I could just aim at that fancy glowing, there we go. And so this is phase two, where the room is destroyed and uh, the boss becomes much more difficult. Um, I'm not going to take the fight any farther, but I'm going to attempt to not die here. Uh, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, please play the game and get to the golem, as this is just... Oh, this is truly epic. Uh, but before we end this presentation, there are quite a few other topics that we need to get through. Uh, one of which is my apparent lack of skill at the, uh, the boss fight. <laughs> Thank you. Let's talk about how we got here. It's been an exciting several months, starting with a pitch back all the way at the end of August and culminating with our full release on April 23rd. At the end of August, every student had to come up with one to two pitches for a thesis project. Of those uh, roughly 120 ideas, we had to narrow it down to 20, and one of those 20 was Geomancer, an idea that Andrew Corum came up with. The idea was remarkably similar to what we have ended up with. You play as the Geomancer, someone who can use earth manipulating abilities. The game was inspired by Breath of the Wild, and it wasn't certain whether or not there would just be puzzles, combat, or what have you, but as you can see in the GIFs on the screen, the game looked very much like what we ended up with, the ability to uh, elevate pillars of earth, and so on. Of the 20 pitches, five were selected to move forward and become the final thesis projects. Geomancer was one of these. From here, we went from a team size of 5 to 15. This is when I joined. The first thing that we had to do was organize the team. With 15 people, we knew that communication would be difficult, and so what we decided to do was create four different internal teams. Production, art, design, and engineering. Once each team was formed, we, were given, or we gave them each a lead. That way, everyone knew that they had somebody that they could talk to and that there was a line of communication so that issues could be solved quickly and we knew who would be solving those issues. From there, we moved into what we called a vertical slice level. In industry, a vertical slice is a small portion of the game that is as complete as it can be and should be representative of a finished product. We knew that we weren't really gonna get this, so it was a bit of a semantical difference, but we figured that what we needed was a template moving forward to create a uh, broader game because we had the manpower and we knew that we wanted to build something really great. 
The vision of the project at the time was to have one hub area that, cre that connected to four linear levels. The hub area was going to be inspired by Mario 64's hub, and the four levels were supposed to represent four different environmental types that the Geomancer could test out their abilities in. We of course had the desert that we ended up with, but we also tried out a snowy environment, a grassland, and an oasis. For the vertical slice, we decided to focus on the one environmental type that we knew we were going to have in the game, the desert. From here, we started enacting one of our design philosophies, test the game early and often. We created a, a Slack channel that all the grad students and faculty could access where we would place our builds either weekly or bi-weekly. They would be able to play and faculty took great advantage of this, streaming our game often. Every time they would play, they would give feedback and give us the recordings. We would use that to great effect. All of this culminated in the school's event, EAE Play, when we launched our full vertical slice build. At EAE Play, we had Josh Marchand, our user research expert, set up several testing stations and every place where we had a player, we had video recording of the gameplay itself, as well as a survey for the user to uh, fill out at the end. We got lots of data from this and between EAE Play and what the faculty was giving us as feedback through their streams, we got a lot of good info that we used to inform all of our decisions moving forward. Coming back from winter break, we began working from our vertical slice to what would become our early access build. What was initially a linear experience consisting of two open world areas, a small temple, and a golem fight became an open world with two temples and several different shrines. For those of you who aren't familiar with Legend of Zelda, a temple is usually several different rooms, each consisting of a puzzle, whereas a shrine is about one. This was our way of trying to scope the game so that it would still feel very large, all the while not creating too much content for ourselves. We felt our original goal of having one hub world and four different levels connected to it might have been out of scope. From there, we began filling out the open world and the shrines slowly gave way to environmental puzzles. Our tutorial area and golem fight both morphed into temples of their own, and before we knew it, we had an open world and four temples. We were right back where we started in terms of scope, and we seemed to be doing quite well. By the time we started early access, we actually had the ability to play all the way through the game. The only thing that was missing were the cinematics at the opening and closing of the game, as well as our final Golem boss fight. Despite COVID shutting down the school right around the time of spring break, we were able to go into early access on Friday, March 13th. Coming out of our early access release, we transitioned smoothly into remote work. I wanna give a special thanks to our leads because without you guys, we really couldn't have done it. They gave up some of their time off just so that they could lay the groundwork for everybody to come back. But ever since, we've been working towards our April 23rd release date. We've been adding the features that I previously said were missing and polishing those that were already present. As of that release, we had 6,582 unique downloads, 1,993 wish lists, and an average Steam review rating of positive. Before continuing, I wanted to give a special thanks to Audio Brew. Audio Brew is the company that we contracted to compose our music, voice our dialogue, and create our sound effects. They've been incredibly warm and enthusiastic ever since meeting up with us, and even after their contract ended, they've kept in constant contact with us, offering any help that we've needed. You guys have been awesome. Thank you so much. Let's meet the teams. As I said before, we have a production, art, design, and engineering team. Let's start with the production team, which included me, Galen Fries. Uh, my responsibilities included forming the different teams at the start of the project, selecting the leads, and running lead meetings once or twice a week. I also uh, created and gave our sprint reviews every two weeks, as well as being our main point of contact with our audio contractor, Audio Brew. Uh, in addition to production, I served as our narrative designer. Uh, I wrote our script for the game, though I cannot say that the ideas were original to me. I worked with our vision holder and several and other members of the team, taking suggestions from everyone and creating an amalgamation of all the ideas into one cohesive, albeit small, narrative. 
even though I am technically the sole member of the production team, I should also note and give props to uh, Josh Marchand and Andrew Coram, both of which are in the production track in the program. Uh, Josh was of great help in uh, curating our Steam page, uh, so I definitely wasn't alone in the production team, even though in title I was the only producer. Um, but that was production was like. So let's move on to the art team, which will be hosted by Alec Johnson. Let's take a look back at the art team's production of Maya of the Desert. Um, our art team here at Emergency Entrance Studios aimed to create a sense of mysticism and grandeur for the players in Maya of the Desert. To achieve this, we reference real life supernatural landscapes such as Red Rock Slot Canyons in southern Utah, as well as Petra, Jordan. We coupled the real world features with a muted desert color palette and a unique cell shader inspired by 2008 Prince of Persia. Let's check out our, how our talented art team pulled this off in our game. Lisa Evanson was our primary, primary character artist. She concepted, modeled, and textured our main protagonist, Maya, using industry standard applications such as Marvelous Designer, ZBrush, and Substance Painter. Elisa also created our main Golem villain it, using the same process. She completed all of our 2D promotional art that covers our Steam page. Elisa also helped out with a handful of hero assets such as our desert statues, murals, cat spirit, and banners that cover our temple walls. Fabio Callahan played two roles on our team, uh, environment artist and level designer. Uh, on the environment art team, his primary work came in the Oasis Temple, in which he modeled and textured the hero assets throughout the temple. He modeled a set of pottery that is used throughout our game uh, as a uh, form of exploration to crack open these pots and pans uh, to explore uh, different collectibles. Josh Duddleston was our technical animator. He scripted an auto rigger that sped up our pipeline for rigging and animating uh, all of our characters in the game. He handled all these animations in Unreal Engine to ensure they sync properly with engineered game events utilizing state machines. He created all animations for the player character enemy boss and NPCs using a mixture of motion capture data and hand keyed animations. Josh used engine dynamics to create blended animations and cloth simulations. Additionally, Josh authored motion capture shoots to develop our in-game cinematics, which greatly helped solidify our game's narrative. Colton Eichers was our self-proclaimed Houdini master during production. He procedurally generated rocks for our character to geomance, as we like to call it. He also created a dynamically generated destruction system in Houdini that allowed us to model a single clean model, hand it to Colton, and Colton would return a damaged and broken piece of that model um, that was immediately game ready, game res with UVs and textures. Um, Colton created a 3D mesh simulation for our temple uh, fire, as well as um, a sand extrusion effect for all of our pillars that our character pulls from the earth. Um, Colton also helped with a few 3D models throughout the environment, such as uh, a couple variations of columns, as well as a push cube. Liz Ivy was our visual effects and shaders uh, guru. She scripted the Toon Shader that is so prominent throughout our game. Uh, the Toon Shader had a variety of editable, editable parameters, which made it super easy to hone in on the exact look we were aiming for in game. Um, she created the targeting reticle effect that helped indicate to the player where they could and could not extrude Earth from. Was also created the ambient spirit effect that helped bring our geomancer spirits to life as well as the water shader that filled out our oasis temple. As for myself, uh, I was the art lead at Emergency Ancient Studios. Uh, in this position, I helped establish and maintain the desired art direction throughout production. I supervised the achievement of milestones for the art team and helped form an inspiring work environment 
through regular collaboration and meetings with the team members. Uh, additionally, I was the primary environment artist. Being the primary artist on such a large game, creating reusable assets was of the utmost importance because we had to decorate this massive open world. Um, so to achieve this, I modeled a modular kit that forms the architecture for all of our temples. I also created a texture trim sheet that helps add variation to these modular meshes. Um, I also created two master materials in Unreal and every uh, texture we see in game is a child of this simple um, material, master material. Um, it allowed us to get a lot of usage out of a single material graph instead of having to create unique materials for every asset. Um, finally, I created the desert landscape material and sculpted the dunes with help from the USGS, uh, United States Geological Service height map. And finally, I handled all the lighting in the game, which was an easy pass thanks to the tune shader created by Liz that really drove a lot of the lighting home. And that is the story of Maya of the Desert's art. Hey everyone, this is Andrew Korm. I am the lead designer on Maya of the Desert project, and I'm going over the personal contributions of everyone on the design team. So starting with myself, um, I came up with the core mechanic of the Elevate Earth. And with this one, we wanted to make sure that the player was empowered through this environmental manipulation. And with it, we also want to make sure that this one mechanic could be used in lots of different kinds of ways. And with that also, we wanted to make sure that there were flexible solutions for the puzzles that we designed. So here is a gift from the prototype uh, way back when and kind of the starting point of where we were. And some issues that we found is that with too much freedom, it would break a lot of the design intentions that we had. So we just had to establish some rules and restrictions for this, that being um, if it was natural earth, you could manipulate from it. But if it was man manipulated like earth, like a chiseled stone, for example, then you would not be able to, you know, elevate earth from that. Uh, and this is where we ended up is kind of these d areas of specific places you could extrude from. Uh, and then like outside, you would be able to extrude from most places. Uh, I also did some level design work, uh, specifically the tutorial area right off the bat. Uh, so with this, it was pretty integral that the player l learn the rules and concepts. And so with this first part, they learn how to elevate Earth. With the second part, they learn how to push-pull objects. And with the third part, they learn how to push-pull objects and break walls and vases and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, some problems we had with this area, though, is that the controls still needed to be explained a little bit more than what we had. So we created these murals and this UI that the player could interact with if they wanted to. Uh, moving on to the other area I designed, that would be the Golem Temple and the Arena. Uh, this area is right at the end of the game, and we wanted to kind of take everything that the player had learned from, from the game so far and kind of create a final climactic battle. Um, so as they're moving through here, they make the way to their golem and have that last battle. Uh, with this area in particular, we had some unreliable physics that we had to design around. So namely this little seesaw thing, we had to be mindful of players extruding into that and making the physics go all crazy. So uh, just figuring out things, designing around those issues. Uh, moving on to June Howe, he's our systems designer. Uh, he created our mana system. Uh, this is a system that we had to make so the player had freedom to how they wanted to distribute their mana. Uh, and so it had to be a pretty unique system. But we also had to make sure that there was a cap so it didn't break any designs. So with this system, uh, you would create a pillar and then destroy your oldest one and it'd redistribute it. So that worked pretty well. Um, the issue that we ran into with that, though, was just teaching the player that system. So what we had to do is we address that through our UI where the mana bar uh, would show, you know, that mana going back in there. 
Uh, Junhao also created the detach slash break off system. Uh, we just wanted to merge these two core concepts. Uh, and so what we kind of came up with was where you would elevate it out and then to break it off. And this worked pretty well in theory, but when we started to implement it, uh, we were running into some technical issues. So uh, we just had to do a slight redesign and where you just snap off the top part and that worked out pretty well. So that's how we proceeded. Moving on to Rangda, he was our level designer and he did the Earth Temple exit to the desert area. And this is right after the tutorial. So the main thing with this area was demonstrating the fundamentals that the player had learned in the tutorial and applying them to how they were going to be used in the game. So as you're making your way through this temple, there's gates and switches that you had to press and use your powers to do so. Uh, he also designed the dark temple. Um, this is where you did the you unlock the magic carpet ability, and so just setting up situations where the player had to uh, use this ability to get to the end um, so they pr could proceed. Uh, and then Ranga also did the outside interactions, or a, a, a good chunk of them. Uh, and these are just little areas with optional collectibles around the environment. This was just to populate the environment with some interesting and fun things to reward the player for exploring. And then moving on to our wonderful Fabio. Um, so Fabio, being part artist as well, created our modular level design assets. Uh, these were super helpful for cohesive spacing and scale throughout the game from designer to designer. Uh, it also helped designers create these levels pretty quickly. And then it also made sure that the aesthetics were staying uniform and to also help with the art pass. Uh, some issues that we had with this, we had some lighting issues, but uh, once we increase the scale of these, uh, that kind of addressed that. And then the time it took converting from a white box BSP assets to modular assets uh, took a little time, but once we established our, our level design workflow, uh, we had smooth sailing after that. Uh, moving on to Fabio's level design work, uh, he started out with this layout top-down map, uh, his architecture background shining through, and kind of here's the end result. Uh, in this area, he designed these puzzles as well. So we have this extreme puzzle where you have to push these blocks around to show an image and it unlocks the, the next area. Uh, he also came up with a crystal push-pull puzzle. And this is, you just had to color match these blocks to the right statues. And then in his temple, he also had to use the uh, break off mechanic because that's where you unlock the ability. So here he's snapping off the piece and then throwing out a switch and then moving it. So utilizing that power was pretty important for this area. And then last we have Josh, he did our UX and UI. Uh, a lot of his stuff was compiling and filtering data from these playtests and then prioritizing these issues, whether it's a low priority, medium, or high, conducting team specific meetings and sharing these results and then suggesting solutions. Super helpful for all teams, whether it's art or engineering or design. Uh, Josh also did the UI. So we just want to make sure that was easy to understand and intuitive. Uh, we also did, he also did the UI for the onboarding, the tutorial areas, and then also some of the UI for readability issues. And that's a quick summary of everyone's work on the design team. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Alex Coford. I'm the engineering lead for uh, Maya the Desert. I'm here to talk about our individual contributions. Starting with myself, um, I was the lead, so that came with delegating tasks and organizing our Trello board or random Google Docs and stuff, a lot of meetings. I also worked on our Elevate mechanic. Uh, I was the primary person that worked on that. So that's our elevating and rescinding the pillars and them interacting with various puzzles and mechanics. 
I also worked on, uh, at the end I worked on the magnesis mechanic. Um, so that's where we pick up and throw the boulders and all that. Uh, I also was the one who did the break off mechanic, which kind of tied those previous two together. So you can break off the top or of your pillar and throw it around. I also worked on a lot of the juice in our game. Um, as I, you know, or as Gabe always calls juice. So things like camera pans or activating emissives on puzzle completion, um, the start menu, and the main menu, how the camera's flying around the desert. Uh, I worked on that. Um, I also was the engineer that helped artists whenever they needed help implementing stuff, tying it in with the mechanics and so on. Um, I This semester, one of my primary focuses was working on level streaming, so there's a seamless or like an instant trans uh, teleportation between the levels, um, and there was much stuff there. Um, I also worked on the pickups, so we have various pickups, like the collectibles or ones that unlock abilities and all that, and then. I also did a lot of juice on the boss fight, um, things like the camera shake, pans, the level changing was a big one, and then just resetting it all at the end there. Tezika, uh, Tezika had a lot, he talked a lot with Audio Brew, um, he worked closely with them. Uh, he was our primary person on sound, so he implemented basically all the sound effects and the background music and transitions um, and there's a lot of work that goes into that for like the sound effects you know you want it to be localized and fade off at a distance and stuff and so he did a great job there uh, he also did our mantle mechanic so that's where you know to help players with their platforming um, it was, hold on. Uh, he also did the magnesis mechanic at the beginning, um, and then I took over from him later when he switched over to the audio, uh, so that was good. He also did some of the moving platforms and some other puzzle-related mechanics. Dane, um, Dane did slateboarding, uh, one of our most popular mechanics that unfortunately did not make it into the final game. Many tears were shed, but you know it is what it is. Uh, he, did, Dane, was typically the engineer that helped the design team so whenever they they just would grab him for every every little thing uh, so he did rolling boulders those were that was in our uh, vertical slice he did ramps that fall over uh, when you break the pillars beneath them he did the breakable pillars so the destruction and all that um, he did these scales which are pretty cool uh, he did he did Dane worked on most of the gates and buttons that associated with them. Uh, he also did this puzzle where you slide the boulders around and they're locked onto the track. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, Dane also did a ton of the work on the UI. Um, so the pause menu, the start screen. He also was our primary person working on saving and loading. Um, and all, everything that's associated with that. He also did the checkpoint system, so if you you know if you die, you don't have to restart the whole game. Uh, he also did all of the work on achievements, uh, which was pretty cool. And yeah, well, except for I don't think he did the art assets for achievements, but that's all right. Uh, on on worked on his the real time terrain editing, um, which is also a fluid simulation. Um, this was uh, an idea that was going to be if we could have a more in-depth uh, elevate mechanic to actually manipulate the terrain directly, uh, but to due to mostly design reasons, uh, the challenges associated with designing puzzles around something that can be there's just so much that the player could do with that. Uh, we decided to go with a more simplistic approach, which is basically spawning cubes. So that was, uh, but he did a lot of work on that. 
Um, and also did work on the UI. Um, he, he, uh, he worked with Josh and Dane and on implementing some of that. He was also the one who did the AI for the boss. So earlier I said I worked on a boss fight. I mostly have done things like changing the level um, when you're halfway done or the camera shakes or the sound effects and animations, but on did the AI. Um, he also worked on our wind mechanic that blows the player back. Um, that was in the vert vertical slice. Uh, it's not currently in our final build. Um, and he also uh, worked on some other things as well, uh, some other puzzle mechanics. Um, and then of course there's the millions, thousands of bugs that we all all every engineer have worked on, <laughs> probably spent more time than anything else just fixing bugs. Uh, but yeah, that was our engineer's contributions. Thanks to everybody out there watching from everyone here at Emergency Entrance Studios. You can go over to our site, emergencyentrancestudios.com, if you want to learn anything about anyone on our team. We've got bios there, and uh, they're a bunch of great people. So I encourage you to see what they're like. Uh, I also encourage you to try out our game, Maya of the Desert. It's out now, free on Steam. There's no reason to not give it a try. So uh, see you guys out there in the desert.